We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal, perpetual noviceship. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. This is our flag and our mascot, Franklin. The lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resource of <clears throat> the resonance of truths understood. It awakens and excites us and makes us hungry for more. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Amber Case, the cyborg anthropologist and tech consultant researching prosthetic culture. And are you ready to go? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you for the great introduction. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about some things that I'm interested in, not necessarily the standard speech that I give, but a, a, a kind of a mumble jumble of everything that, I mean, well, maybe I'll give some rants along the way. But basically, I'm interested in interfaces, and I'm interested in humans, and interested in computers, and interested in society and technology. And one day, I was at college, and there was a, a philosophy colloquium, and this woman showed up and said, I'm going to speak on cyborg anthropology. And I said, what the heck, that really exists? She said, yeah, it's a subsection of the anthropology of science, developed in 1993. And I said, can I major in it? And she said, yeah, sure. And I said, okay, I'll be that, like that day. And wrote my <laughs> thesis later, uh, she was my thesis advisor, on cell phones and their techno-social sites of engagement, which meant that I just walked around campus looking really weird with a notebook, writing down what people did with their cell phones all day. And then I would go visit other places and, and, and do some surveys on Facebook. Um, but I've also been interested in the actual technical objects and, and how people are interacting with them, and also the screens within those objects that become increasingly complex that you keep having to upgrade all the time. So this talk will cover a few things. One, why technology is playing an increasing role in our lives, and how interfaces have changed over time. I'll go through a, th a few historical examples, mostly Steve Mann, the quirky stuff, uh, none of the really serious stuff. And then uh, current future so design, things without buttons or things where buttons are trying to evaporate and go away so that we can actually deal with, with data and technology without having to hit buttons all the time because buttons are kind of annoying. Um, and then uh, innovative design, so anything that has alternative inputs, not necessarily buttons, but GPS or voice or you know touch, uh, something like that. So first off, we're all cyborgs. Now, before you think, oh, I'm not really a cyborg, I don't look like, you know, the Terminator, you could say, well, technically people were cyborgs with the first tools because they were in a human object interaction, and that interaction existed outside of themselves to help them do something, right? So say a saber-toothed tiger goes out and destroys an animal and its tooth breaks off. Well, it'll probably end up dying because it can't you know, do anything. But if it evolves that tooth outside of its mouth and turns it into a spear and figures out new ways to make that spear sharper, so that if that spear, when thrown, breaks, doesn't really do anything, you just pick up a new spear and make something else, then, you know, you don't die if your tooth breaks because it's a spear. You can just make a new one. So when humans begin to evolve external features outside of themselves to make so that they could adapt to new environments, they all became cyborgs. And it's not whether or not you're a cyborg, it's that you're either a low-tech cyborg or high-tech cyborg, depending at what moment you're interacting with techno-social devices. So he's kind of a low-to-medium-tech cyborg right there on his computer. Um, if you're wearing glasses, you're a pretty low-tech cyborg because the glasses aren't, you know, computing things for you. If you wore glasses that uploaded a new prescription from the internet, uh, depending on what time of day it was, if you were groggy or not, and what you needed to see, you would be a high-tech cyborg. So there's just these different levels of cyborgs. So what's an official definition of cyborg? There was a 1960 paper on, on space travel, and the definition was an organism to which exogenous components have been added for the purpose of adapting to new environments. Well, basically, the best definition for that is a spacesuit, right? What kind of environment is space? You're not supposed to go in space. As a human, you're supposed to die. Don't go outside of this <laughs> nice little bubble that you've evolved in, right? So you're not supposed to go up to Mount Everest, right? No, like goats can go to, you know, mountain goats can go up mountains, penguins can go to the Antarctic. And for some odd reason, humans said, well, if we attach these external components to ourselves, we can do anything. We can instantly evolve into, you know, an amphibian or some ice giant or some god that floats above the earth. So th this is kind of what's going on, right? So what's, so for a long time, these prosthetic devices have been dealing with externalizing the, you know, uh, the physical extension of self. So th this is teaching somebody how to get into a car in a nice way. The thing is when you, <laughs> when you climb into a car, <laughs> uh, 
your senses actually extend to the edges of that vehicle. So, you know, when you're parallel parking or you're stopped at a stop sign, your senses are actually out at the front of the car. And if somebody tries to hit you, or almost hits you, you feel this reflex. And you don't necessarily feel it, you know, in your arm, because, you know, your, your uh, physiological self is mapped to the edges of the car. So you're feeling it in the car, even though the car doesn't exist. But you're feeling it in the mental map that your brain has made for that car. So for most of the industrial revolution, we were trying to extend our physical selves, extend how, you know, how hard we can, you know, press a button, we press a little button, and then something big happens, you know, or you know, we have a big machine and we're gonna go somewhere, or let's let's have a rocket ship, right? So something happened after a while, and they said, well, we need to start doing some calculations so that we can make advanced weapons, and so they started making these computers. Now there's a strange thing about a computer. If you look at a physical tool like a hammer over 3,000 years, nothing really changes, right? It is this shape is pretty much the same over time. Um, but if you look at a computer, nothing about this says what it actually does. It looks like a bunch of refrigerators with like a little control console that looks like an enormous like radio Walkman that you could press and it fills the room with music. So what what is this, right? Nothing about this says what it actually does, right? So with this, there's a limitation on to, you know, the physical shape of something. You can't make a car this small or else nobody can drive it. But if you make a computer smaller and smaller, nothing really happens. You just get more functionality and more portability. And the reason that these things are shrinking and evaporating, all that is solid is starting to melt and, and evaporate into air, all this functionality, is because these are extensions of the mental self instead of, of the physical self. And our mental selves are pretty invisible. You don't really see what somebody's thinking. It's really tiny. Uh, the physical world's really enormous, but there's this invisible world. So we're seeing this you know, evolution of, of these mental prosthetic devices. And now if you look at ads for this stuff, it's like car ads, you know? Car ads are like, wow, your external prosthetic device is really awesome looking, you know? You're just wearing this like shell and it's really hot and like people are attracted to each other's shells that they can buy. <laughs> I mean, we live in a really weird society where we're all these shedding shells and then getting the next best shell with a shinier paint. But now you're getting like the best prosthetic for your ear. It's like, wow, your ear device is awesome, you know? <laughs> and if you, <laughs> if you go to other countries, you can see like, you know, some guys will have these really old cell phones. They'll be like bricks. And they'll be over in the corner of a bus like this, like hiding, you know? They don't want anybody to see their cell phone, especially girls, because girls will be like, ha ha, you are so unevolved. Your external prosthetic sucks and you're no longer attractive, <laughs> right? So it's this, this kind of co-creation process. It's no longer just you and your attractiveness. It's the clothes you wear and the, the external mental device, like my second brain is really attractive. <laughs> There's another strange thing about devices though. When you put something into them, the device doesn't get heavier. You can put in all the photos you want, and you don't, you know, you don't just sit there, oh, my phone is so heavy, there's so much data in here. No, it, so everybody's carrying around these little Mary Poppins bags. They're like, oh, you want, you want to see this? Hey, look at my picture from China. Hey, look, I can even go to China with a click of a button, click. It doesn't like have China show up and go, oh, ah, China, you know? It, these are these little magical devices, right? So the problem is that it's easier to put data inside of a, of a device than to take it out. This is, this is kind of like the, the upsetting part. So you can take thousands of photos, but you can't ever see the photos because they're all stuck in a device. And you know, it's that one day that you would sit down and like look through all your photos and your album, but that day never arrives because you're always being interrupted by all this different, you know, reactions and text messages and the really cool article that you saw linked from somebody on Twitter. So you can never just have that uninterrupted time to go look through it. But yet, when you lose all of these items, you feel this physiological loss because you've stored all of these memories in your second brain. And you store lots and lots of things in your second brain. And when your second brain fails, really, if you print out your eight years of photos, that's how much is in your laptop. And it's probably like a thousand pounds of, of data, right, if you printed it out. And so when you lose it, you actually feel that loss. You feel like part of your brain is kind of gone, right? So, so our memories have been externalized and now they're you know, kind of mapped to our brains. And when we lose something, we feel that feeling. The other thing is that all these buttons that we used to see, like in the beginning, you'd press a button 
And if the button didn't work, you say, oh crap, you go around the back and you figure it out, you rewire it. If you want to do, oh no, I want a new button, then you have to make a physical button and wire it up and do something. And now you have a multiplicity of buttons. This is, this is representing infinite buttons. You want a new button, you wire it in. The, the interface has evaporated, it's turned to liquid. This is literally liquid, you know? Um, so what's the next step? If you, if you look at the water cycle, you have solid, and you have liquid, and you have air. So what's a button in the middle of an air? Well, it, it must be something where it's an event. So if an event happens, then something happens on your phone. So I'll go over that in, in terms of curtain buttons in the second section. Um, the other thing is that whenever you call somebody, you know, you can stand on one side of the world, whisper something, and be heard on the other, right? And you just press a button. And, well, what's really happening is you get these kind of wormholes. <laughs> like, one side of the Earth, I mean, not technically, but one person is connecting, and the other person is connecting, and for that brief instance, they're completely connected at the speed of light. Great. And then they release the wormhole, and they go back to their regular space. But the thing is that that interface, that little wormhole, is getting higher and higher resolution. So first, you know, it was just text, and it was really ugly consoles, and we were on BBS systems, like type, type, type. And we got some semblance of emotions and information, and now you have these high-resolution experiences where it's like the person is actually there in the room. You have FaceTime, and, and you can actually see your parents on Skype, you know, and, and they're there. So it's this high-resolution transportation, you know, they're not physically transporting, but man, it looks like they're right there. So this is expanding over time, and everybody's getting linked so now I'm going to go into some philosophy. So this guy, Mark Auger, uh, came up with this theory of supermodernity. Um, so forget that word for a moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he talked about that the world, the modern world, is plagued with these non-places. He said, well, what's a place? A place is something that's identified by um, uh, relation, history, and identity. And in our modern society, you know, we're stuck in all these external shells, driving down the road, from point A to point B, we're not at a point A or point B, we're stuck in this liminal space. We're stuck in this purgatory, right? And we can't do anything. We can't just like Mario Brothers style, like jump over the other cars and hop over them and get to our destination. Everybody's frustrated at the same time. They don't really like what they're doing, but they can't communicate with each other. The only thing that they do is like flip each other off if they get into each other's space, you know? So what do they do? You know, there's no identity, you know, you go buy a car and maybe it's like a Ferrari and maybe it's some identity, but on, on, you know, in a regular condition, there's not much identity. You go down the highway again and again, there's not much history. It's not like you're going by an old village and, you know, talking to people in your village and, and you know, there's no relation to anybody, right? So it's a non-place, right? Um, the same in an airport. You go into an airport and there's just, just somebody going through an airport and everybody's so annoyed and it's just like this unfortunate experience. And, you know, even today, you go down the streets of a major city, you're not talking to anybody like in a village where you say, hey, here's some gossip, hey, let's talk about this, like, let's figure this out, and there's this problem in the village. You're, you're getting, you know, you're, you're in a non-place. It's not here or there. So what people have ended up doing is the only thing that they can do is they use their little, you know, wormhole device, and they suddenly connect to somebody that they know. They suddenly have an identity, and they suddenly are relating to somebody who they have history with. So what does this mean? It means that unlike an airport, the physical state of the airport, or like a really ugly school building, or, or a yucky highway, that the internal space of a phone is actually a real place. It has identity, it has relation, and it has history. And it's often preferred to regular life. Um, so this is kind of what he argued in, in this book. But the problem is that Usually, you, you know, the public space, you'd walk outside and things would happen. Now it's filled with all these private conversations. So as you walk through the city, you know, it's, it's no longer that you're sitting in a nice room with a landline phone and you're talking for an hour at a time. You're walking down the street with your conversation. And so, uh, <laughs> Nicholas Rodriguez. <laughs> this is actually one of my favorite projects. Uh, Nick Rodriguez is... Uh, an industrial designer that, that came up with a portable cell phone booth and it actually, if you, you know, pull it up, it will go and compress into a backpack and then you can walk <laughs> around with it and whenever you need to have a conversation, you open it up, put it on, um, and then you can talk on your phone. So what he did is he would walk around town with this, you know, especially in New York. And he would go to checkout counters and, and start ordering things, and, and he'd be like, oh, sorry, and he would pull up the thing, and la la la, like, right when he was checking out. And 
anyway, the thing is that we probably need some cell phone booths now. You know, it would be really nice. I know that some coffee shops now have phone booths in them. And you can go in there with your cell phone and actually have a private conversation. The, the, the private world is, is decreasing, actually, because the public space that we used to have is filled with all these private conversations that aren't really private, and you're hearing half of somebody's life. So one of the problems that happens is that, you know, you don't really know where you know, humans end and machines begin because you're getting these portions of somebody's identity, you know, and you're giving part of your identity through this device. So cyborg anthropology kind of looks at this. Like, for instance, if I look at this kid and say he's talking to his grandmother, where does his grandmother end and where does she begin? Well, traditionally, she's a person. And where she ends physically and where she begins physically are the same thing. But when she's extended through this device, she actually is also a voice. And that voice is disembodied and thrown through communication channels and outputted on this side. And he's hearing a, a small percentage of the essence of his grandmother. So she's really like disembodied and cybernetically extended through this device. And so this is what kids are, you know, growing up with, these, these seemingly magical devices. So let's talk about some history. So things with buttons. Um, I'm going to tell you about a strange character, his name is Steve Mann, and he was obsessed with technology for a very long time. His father was in the textile industry, and he was obsessed with electronics, and when he was young he went to the local television repair store, and he said, I really want to repair televisions. And the guy said, why do you want to repair televisions? He says, I want to make a really small television that I can fit it in my eye, like this. And then I want to watch the world through the television. He said, well, you're crazy, and also you're like 12 years old, so get out of my shop. And so Steve Mann kept going back, and ended up fixing some of these really complicated problems after a while. Um, and he was kind of a, a strange kid, as you can see. He's wearing about 80 pounds of computer equipment. Um, he started to wear these things um, when he went to MIT and started the wearable computing department. And he would wear this 80 pounds of equipment through campus all the time except when he was, you know, showering or sleeping or swimming. Um, and it took him an entire year to get one of his friends, you know, to also wear a wearable computing outfit. But he said, it's not really a big deal because these 80 pounds will evaporate and turn into 40 pounds. So it won't be that big of a deal. And, you know, well, in 1994, it's about, you know, 30 or 40 pounds of equipment. Um, the other thing <coughs> is that he hated seeing other people's messages and hearing other people's messages. So he kept going by all these billboards. And he just said, why do I have to look at other people's messages? Why can't I look at my own messages? So he took a little camera and put it on the side of his head. And they had a little screen right here. And what he did is he took reality in, processed it around the back of his head, and inputted it back into his other eye. And he called this diminished reality, because what he did is he recognized the rectangles in these advertisements. And he put his own messages on top of them <laughs> so that he could browse the internet and see his own messages instead of somebody else's around town. And this ended up working out really well, so he applied it to more things. Um, eventually, he met uh, who, um, a, a woman who would later be his wife. And they met during the time that he was putting metallic uh, paste into his hair to conduct electricity so that he could have his own wireless network. Um, <laughs> because he was broadcasting himself, I think, for an entire year. Um, so you could go look through his goggles online and tell him, you should turn left, you should turn right, you should go and do this. And of course, he would see these messages on the street signs. <laughs> so this is actually uh, his, his wife says, Steve, you've gone too far again. You, know, you need to turn left on, on Bay Street. But at no time does he need to look down at his device because he has it in his eye. He looks a little weird, yes, but he gets all the information he needs. What, he, what else he ended up doing is he said, you know, I really hate all the advertisements for products in stores. And, you know, stores are set up specifically so that you spend a lot of time in them, right? So he said, well, I, I don't like this anymore. So he would go to the store, and whatever item he didn't buy, or whatever item he didn't like, he would recognize the brand, and then he would get rid of it. And then he would never see that brand again. So say he didn't like Alpine 2% milk, that would disappear from the store all of the stores, and then he didn't like this brand, all of that would disappear from the store. Until he would just go down the aisles of the store and he'd just see the products he wanted. So his shopping trip was <laughs> 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 And then uh, his wife would also say, oh, don't get that 2%, and then she would cancel it out too. So it was <laughs> <laughs> 
Then when he went to the cash register, he could see the past transactions that he had with the person in terms of like communication. Um, you know, maybe if she shortchanged him at some point, you know, if she had any kids or whatever. Conversation topics, because he had a really hard time, one, remembering people's faces, and two, making small talk. So if he just took notes on people and had those appear on them when he got to the checkout counter in real life, he wouldn't have to ever remember anything, just have external brain taking care of all of that. After a while, he um, began to, this is actually from his display, he reads sideways, um, and this is his wife saying, remember this woman, uh, this is about the ATM card that got mailed to the wrong place. So just all these notes on life. And around this time, he started a thing called the Borg Group. So a bunch of guys who were doing the same thing, and he ended, he's actually uh, at the University of Toronto right now, he, he teaches a class called Wearable Computing. And in the class, you are expected to make your own Borg uh, uh, outfit, basically. And you take notes on it in class, and you can write your thesis paper on it. Um, and you use a little key cording device that fits in the palm of your hand so that while you walk down the street, you can be typing away at you know, 60 words per minute. And he always said that, why do we contort to a computer and sit like this, hunched down? We should be able to have the computer to conform to us so that we can walk around and do whatever we want. On one of his first dates with his wife, he did the body swap experiment where he basically had her put on a camera and he put on a camera. And the whole time she was viewing what it was like to be the other person in the date. So he was viewing the date from oh, her perspective wow. and she was <laughs> viewing the, yeah. And anyway, they, they work out really well together. They're still married. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a test. <laughs> and eventually he ended up evolving this quite a bit now it fits in this pair of very stylish sunglasses. Um, and the present day, it's tiny, 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 tiny. This is actually right there is um, the laser uh, input display into his eye. So it's, it's a perfect display. He has video, comes in here, presses around the back, and then feeds into his eye. And it's barely even noticeable, except for the large microphone there. So this whole setup, it has biometric, you know, um, analytics and things that happen. It costs him about $500,000 to develop, um, and he had a lot of government funding and MIT funding. And he did this a long time ago. He started in 1979. He had most of these systems working. The problem is that people have tried to do this now, and it looks pretty dorky. And so until somebody designs a really good system, or Apple, which just w hired a wearable computing expert, um, it's not going to really happen. If you ever want to develop a device like this, you should read Steve Mann's paper, The Wearable Camera, because it's all about developing certain systems like this and what to watch out for. For instance, on the market, you can get video glasses and they cover both eyes, but that means you can't see anything. And when you move around, the refresh rate's really slow and it makes you really sick and it's, it's very bad. So he said, you have to have it go into one eye, you know, and then you have to have a camera, and it costs a lot of money to make. And there's no market for it, because people just want to sit on planes and watch movies on their iPod. They don't want to augment reality with their cameras walking around. And it's pretty slow. Uh, but regardless, people have come up with some things, a small, clippable, wearable camera. It's getting there. It'll, it'll take a, a little bit longer time. This guy doesn't have one of his eyes, and he said, wouldn't it be nice if I created a webcam in my eye? So he put a video camera in his eye, and he can actually film through his eye at really low resolution. And he had Steve Mann help him out. But if you don't want to take out one of your eyes, you <laughs> can get contact lenses. This is not a human eye. That's a rabbit that they put this into, which is a little bit creepy. Um, so I, I think of wearable lenses like this. Like you have 8-bit gaming, and everything is really chunky and pixelated. Then over time, you have 32-bit and 64-bit, and you have these immersive environments with lots of polygons and great refresh rates, and you have collaborative stuff. So I think that's how this will grow over time. We'll have really you know, crappy resolution and, and small amounts of signals. But I don't really like the idea of this, because it's right on your eye, and I, I don't think it's very safe yet. Here's another kind of... Uh, uh, mock-up of, of what it would be like. They have a few prototypes that have been made, but there's this um, there's this comic book. It's called Angel Eyes. The the what happens is this this woman is she well the contact lenses that you can you know tweet people with break down and they cause angel eye syndrome, which is all this like 
horrible technology flowing out and she has to go to the hospital but she doesn't have insurance because the insurance situation is mixed up and she's not wealthy it's it's kind of a dystopia you know like sometimes the future is really good for wealthy people and not really good for there's a bunch of issues on that so I don't, I don't really support these contact lenses yet until they're available <laughs> to everybody but if we look at it how you know technology is going now you can get really good technology if, if you're wealthy so let's talk about evaporating the button so you can have a different type of input say you have a phone with GPS and you run around with GPS all the time you're basically doing this invisible track all over town this invisible route of where you've been and when you do that people can start leaving you notes if you go to aaron.pk slash geonote you can actually leave a note and when Aaron who's back there goes around town um, and he hits one of your notes he'll get a text message that that you sent him but it's based on place <laughs> instead of on your phone so what I do with this is I make some notes right so say I say that's a grocery store I'll draw a note over the grocery store and I'll say pick up the paprika you dork like you always forget the paprika <laughs> and then when I get to the store I get the text message pick up paprika you dork you know? and then I say oh great I get the paprika right so the problem is that when you remember to get something you're often not in the same contextual space as you know when you're going to get it next you know if I'm going to the store in the morning I'm not in the same contextual space as I was at night when I said oh crap I forgot this you know so what you're doing is you're sending a message to your future self based on the location that you will be in. Uh, so it, it works out pretty well. And, and the thing is, there's no real button. The button is you walk into it. You're walking into a mailbox. If you have two phones, you can have both people get notifications when they're near to each other. So both of us will get a text message when we're that far away. And so, you know, say if Aaron Piquet is going to pick me up, I will get a text message that he's about five minutes away, 0.4 miles. And then he doesn't have to message me that says, I'll be there, I just left the house, I'm going to be late. It reduces all these text messages that you have to go through. Like, where are you? Well, I'm 0.4 miles away. Oh, great, you're five minutes away. <laughs> then you just sit there and do whatever you want, and then eventually, you know, somebody, you get the message, right? So the point is that successful interfaces make themselves invisible and let you go on with your life and let you just live without having to worry about a bunch of stuff. Um, so another thing that goes on, so when I go home, uh, it note the, the GPS device says you've entered the circle that you've defined as your house and now the lights are going to turn on a little robot is going to say hello welcome home and the music is going to start playing and so um, how this works and this is something that Aaron set up so if you want to know more you should talk to him he's back there twiddling his thumbs <laughs> uh, so an RC channel and you have a bot named Nurdle and this bot has a timer and a calculator and then you have a satellite and a GPS phone and you basically set a radius that um, when you walk into it, it says you are home and then waits about three minutes for you to walk into your house and then uh, basically says turn on the lights, it hits a switch and welcome home and music. And you can have all of that happen when you get home using this 20 year old protocol called X10, which runs through the power lines and you can set timers for your lights. In fact, if you can get anything to hit uh, a, basically a, a website, you can get it to trigger anything else. So you could say, when I get home, turn on the coffee pot. Or, you know, um, when somebody presses their thumb to a sensor, take a picture of them, upload it to the IRC channel, and turn on the lights for them. <laughs> <laughs> or when the temperature in the kitchen gets above a certain amount of degrees, have the robot say, mm, that smells good, what are you cooking? And freak everybody out. <laughs> <laughs> so that solves companionship. <laughs> <laughs> if you're at home alone in the modern world. Robot <laughs> <Your> boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> or girlfriend. Yeah, so in Japan they have all these bot boyfriends and girlfriends because people are alone all the time and they can't, right. you know, they don't have enough time to actually interact with people. <laughs> so with that, future interaction. <laughs> so this computer mouse, this guy who invented the mouse, um, he is, his name is Doug Engelbart, he developed it in uh, 1963. So it's pretty old. The problem is that he said, okay, this is a temporary solution. I don't expect people to keep using this that's it. Okay, demonstration. 
Everyone's like, oh, the mouse, and they just use it forever. And he said, no, no, please, stop. He was like, There's a better way to interact with data. You're not even touching the data. You're like, you know, you're moving this around, and it's not really doing anything, you know. Uh, so he developed this, this glove where you can actually type um, using binary code. So like it's like A, and then B, and then C, kind of courting. And you can put a little, I mean, you could basically walk around and type on, you know, on your leg if it had conductive uh, thread, and be fine, right? And he can type one-handed too, so he can move a mouse around and then type one-handed like 90 words a minute. And he's like 90 years old, um, or 87, pretty close. Um, so he developed this, but it never caught on. This is actually a pretty recent invention of his, and uh, so that was pretty disappointing. What Steve Mann used all the time is this one-handed keycording device. You just walk around with it, and you you kind of use it like a guitar and you're pressing chords and each chord resolves to a character and this allows you to walk around really you know and type really fast so he can just walk around and you know write his thesis or write a research paper or write a blog post wherever, wherever he's walking and he really liked you know using this a number of people have used this to write their entire dissertations and programmed equations in there and, and things like that and take notes in class so it's pretty cool. Um, I have one if you want to borrow it. Just ask me afterwards. <laughs> but there's another way to do input. Um, I went down to Noisebridge, which is a little hacker space in San Francisco, and uh, put a bunch of little diodes on my head and, and got hooked up to a 1960s EEG machine. And it took like an hour to set up. And it was, there were all these knobs. <laughs> and uh, you know we figured it out after a while. And eventually, the, the brainwave output came out on these little you know, pieces of you know, little ink. And you couldn't really do anything with it. You couldn't say, you know, if this happens, turn it into a signal and make music. You know? So this emotive epic device came out. And you can put this on your head. And within five minutes, you can be moving around objects remotely. So I could sit there and move around a box on the screen, move it up and down and around and spin it. And it's, it's actually pretty easy to use. The other thing that you can do is you can you can convert that into music or, or take that and, and generate something else with it. Or if somebody's paralyzed, they can sit there in bed and they can actually choose uh, keys on a keyboard and type out something. And recently, a, a guy used a, an EEG headset to send a tweet to Twitter. And it was all caps. It said, sending EEG, or sending tweet to Twitter through EEG. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was a sports fan, so he put a bunch of sports uh, tweets, so I unfollowed him. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve Mann, now that he's developed all his cool computer stuff, um, he's decided that he wanted to uh, make music. So he hooked this woman up to an EEG set, and she is thinking, and her thoughts are actually making music. So I like that sort of input device. Um, and then she also went underwater, and, and all sorts of different things happened. This was uh, at a pool in France. They had all these different types of instruments, plasma instruments, and he, he had all the different types of, he had like thought and uh, plasma and solid and liquid and air instruments that were all being played. And he's developing all these different things. So another type of input is haptic or touch or sensory. So this is the components of, um, of a, a little haptic compass belt. So you, you wear it around your waist, like so. <laughs> what it does is it, it buzzes when you're facing north. So you can always tell which way is north. Instead of looking at your iPhone, which has you know, compass interference, or trying to figure out where you were and what street you're facing and looking at the streets. And the guy who initially developed this was riding around on his bike and realized that he could no longer get lost because he always knew where his house was, he always knew where north was, and he always had this sort of sixth sense of history. And the problem is that when you have something visual that tells you directions, or you have something that makes sound that tells you directions, you get all these confusing, you, it's, it's very confusing because in, you know, in reality when you're walking down the street you have all this sound and all this visual stimulus and you need to watch and listen to be safe. So if you compress that sort of you know, stimulus into a belt and just you know, have it go through touch, then it's totally okay because it doesn't interfere with your sound and it doesn't interfere with hearing. And it means that you can actually get more sensory input as you walk down the street. So this has been pretty successful. But you can actually get a kit and build your own. It's a little Arduino in here. This is one of my favorites. Uh, Kelly Dobson grew up in a junkyard, and she really liked putting things together. And she really got this sort of excitement for 
technical devices. One of the things that she really enjoyed was thinking about how machines thought. She said, well, why do machines have to learn our language? Why do, why do we have to say, you know, press a button to say on to a blender? Why don't we speak the blender's language? So she built a blender that you could go <laughs> and the blender would go <laughs> <laughs> and, then she, and then she would turn it up. So <laughs> and, <then she'd, laughs> and then she made a toaster like that. She made a hole. So, so you could just imagine her in her kitchen like, Rah, 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 you know, just all the, the devices coming to life like an orchestra. A lot of people have, have talked about, well, everybody's getting separated from each other. Are they really, you know, talking to each other and touching each other anymore? So uh, this haptic pillow was built. You have a pillow. Each person has a pillow and you hug the pillow and you, you press part of the pillow and you say, hi, can I send you a message? And the person can talk to you through the pillow and you can hug and you can save your hug for later. You can leave a message in a hug and the pillow will hug. Um, so this is sort of thing like, well, touch is, is kind of evaporated and people are in their pods, you know, where all the entertainment comes to them, but they're missing all the stimulus of touch. You know, the, the woman, Christine Noreen, who's doing the, the public isolation project right now, she's being let out at, at 9 o'clock p.m if you want to go over to the, the building where Emma is. She's, she's been in isolation for 30 days without any human touch, but lots of contact through technology. Um, she has this problem. She's like, ah, my, ah, I can't stand it. You know, there's this need for human touch. So a lot of people try to solve that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it ends up being really strange. They have robotic penguins and uh, seals that go into old folks' homes in Japan that provide them with comfort and they don't have you don't have to feed them you don't have to pick up for them you know you can pet them and they have all sorts of, of stimulus and it's actually improved people's moods this sort of thing the water there's there's some LEDs in this faucet and when the water is hot it turns red and when it's cold it turns blue they don't have to worry about burning yourself or they keep touching the water this is just a kind of a simple thing where you, know, you wear some Heelys and they turn into uh, electronic charging and they charge all of your devices in, in your smart jacket. <laughs> this is a, a free book that came out and it's available on the internet. And it, it just tells you how to make your own wearable computing. So if you want to do interesting things like completing circuits when you press a button together that makes LEDs light up so you can put on your jacket and it will turn colors you know, when you press all the buttons together. And it has step-by-step -step instructions on, on how to do that. You know, when you zip your zipper up and it goes all the way to the top, then have this action happen. Or tweet to Twitter that says, I have put my jacket on. You, know, you can do all sorts of interesting things with this. Uh, there's there's the, the button circuit and t teaches you how to sew all this stuff with conductive thread. Uh, the lily pad Arduino was developed for this. This is a, oops. This is a mobile dress and you can get a phone call and then you hold your hand up and you can answer the phone just by doing this action. Uh. The problem is that you probably you can't put it through the laundry, so it's kind of useless. <laughs> It'd be good if you could take it out and put it in another dress. Uh, this one is uh, a massage jacket. So you give somebody a massage, and um, it's actually a game that you can play. So all these people <laughs> are giving massages, but it's a game, and they're winning. And so the person who massages the best wins. They're really just <laughs> controlling characters. <laughs> And you actually build this if you want. Um, uh, this is an instructable. So that's all I have for you, and the Q and A period is now. <laughs> Great speech. Uh, talk. Uh, your definition talked about external devices, but what about internal devices? That's a is good that, question. Is that included as well yeah. for supper? Okay. Yeah. Um, internal devices are interesting because I don't get into that at all, and, and I should, but that's a whole crazy amount of talking. I mean, the, the internal pacemakers and, and the fact that, you know, you have all these sensory technologies that can see right inside your body. They have these new scanners at, at dental shops that are, they, they envision everything. And they, once you get the whole three-dimensional vision of your brain and your teeth. They give the program to kids and they can go and explore their brain and teeth. Um, but it also gives a lot of radiation <laughs> and there's a big problem with you know, potential cancer causing of, of that. Um, there's all the different medical technologies. There's, there's a guy, Christoph Tuscher, at PSU and he's dealing with large uh, like 
large parallel computing, which means millions of bacteria working in unison to solve a problem. Like they can solve mathematical problems, or but you have to figure out um, when you know one sector is attacked and 15,000 of them die, and you still have 15 billion of them left. You know, technically in computing that would be a big problem if you know 15,000 servers went down. So there's this different type of type of complexity that ends up happening. Uh, so there's there's a whole other subject there. Um, there there is one interesting medical application where you know if there's an elderly person and they fall they slip and fall on a tub that the tub can like soften and catch them and then monitor their um, you know their blood pressure and their vital signs and then if they're in critical condition find out the closest paramedic text message them or call them and say come over to this address start giving them directions to get over to the house and then uh, send that email to the hospital. Uh, with their whole profile so that by the time they get there, they know how to treat the patient. Do you think those will eventually, but those are external, do you ever think they'll eventually become internal, where uh, the body will even heal by itself? That would be nice. Um, <laughs> it, it will probably be there for either government, like military first, mm -hmm. um, that you know you have some external skin or you know something that's attached to you that makes well, you I mean, tougher. I, I could see having reservoirs of certain drugs or whatever, mm -hmm. and so the body says, oh, I need insulin, I need this, I right. need whatever. And yeah, self-regulating systems. Itself. Yeah. I'm, I'm, well, it's it's complicated to do stuff internally, but yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense that it, that, that it uh, will I eventually have, happen. I've done those. Well, the defibrillator exists. Yes, like, yes. Uh, you can get one of those. Yeah. I mean, and you have to have a condition first. Like, you do, yeah. And if your heart stops, it shocks you back a lot. There is a picture that I didn't show that, that has uh, a woman who they they fixed her arm and they, you know, they kind of grafted um, a, a plastic that fit onto the bone and they basically rebuilt her arm and put all the sensors back on so that she can, she can actually move it and connect it all to her brain. Uh, it was in National Geographic, you should look at it up. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's basically using the EEG contacts on a stub and, and connecting them all. It's, it's, it's really neat. So. Okay, more questions. <laughs> Steve Mann, um any information about what happens to your eyesight if you're using a cyborg over one eye? Yeah. And try, okay. Yeah, that's and a good question. Um, there is an article where he went through airport security. Now, he is wired head to toe all yeah. the time. Um, I think it was in 1993 or 94, and they said, sorry, you have to take off all of your electronics. And he said, no, 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 don't make me do this. And he said, you have to, I'm sorry. So he had all these diodes hooked up, and, and he took off the, the heads-up display. So one of his eyes is actually sideways. Like, the, the, all the text on the screen is sideways, and you can get used to it. You know, the, the experiment where they put the guy's vision upside down, he gets used to it after 30 days. The thing is, when you take it off, you know, one side of his vision was sideways in real life and he wasn't able to see so he basically like blindly stumbled all over the place and fell down the other thing is that um, the heat caused by his mechanisms like especially when he was wearing 40 to 80 pounds of computing equipment uh, heated up his body so if he took off his devices at night to go to sleep or to go swimming he would get chilled really quickly and he would have to regulate um, how like how he heated himself uh, one of his lab assistants um, messed up uh, and she almost sweated to death because she was doing biofeedback stuff, and it didn't work out yeah, so well. How that affects your organs yeah. over time too. And it's it's a little bit weird. There's a there's a great uh, article if you look up like Steve Mann airport fiasco um, okay. about how he was just messed up totally for a really long period of time afterwards because he's just he's really used to it. And the other thing is, you know, say I were sitting here and I saw all of your profile information and I could easily talk to all of you and suddenly that was taken away, I'd feel terrified, you know. Um. So is there any consideration made for that? I mean, um, you're talking about making devices, machines, objects that kind of the one constant to a machine is that it's going to break someday. And so you have a bunch of people who are becoming reliant mm -hmm. on other people and it's is there any kind of concern about the, the you know, how that's going to work society, in society and even for the individual who suddenly, you know, Steve Mann after 30 years suddenly doesn't see the world like he is used to? And yeah, we have most of the electronic capability of what Steve Mann did. 
except we just hold it up to our faces instead of having it melded to our faces all the time. And so especially people who are used to GPS navigation or, you know, they walk around and, it, you know, there's a lot of signs that are showing up in dead end roads that says your GPS is actually wrong. Turn around. This is a dead end. This is somebody's house. Like, don't come here, you know, <coughs> but people keep pressing on as they said, the map said it and they, they don't look at, you know, the directions. So I like the haptic compass belt because then you, you, know, you can always know where north is. But the other thing is that you... You know, people have always relied on, you know, compasses and external devices, but every day people are used to being able to check their mail, um, interact with somebody, and if there's an emergency, people aren't remembering phone numbers anymore. You know, it's really hard for me to remember my mom's phone number, which is silly <coughs> because that's the one phone number I should know, right? But I keep thinking about it. I don't ever have to type it into the phone. I, I click on a name. I no longer click on numbers anymore. So there, there's these problems. Um, the other thing is that <laughs> this is kind of what I think will happen in the future in, in, in kind of a snarky way. It's, it's more that you know, all these kids in the future will have these EEG machines. They'll be moving objects around and, and they'll be sitting there with immense concentration. You know, and all their parents <laughs> won't be able to concentrate. They'll be socially fragmented and they'll be checking all these different things at once and hooked into the feed and, hey, did you see this? And the kid's like, stop, I'm trying to concentrate, mom. Stop bothering me. You know? and, and they're like, well, don't you want to use the EEG, mom? No, no, I can't focus. I can't. F ah, and you know they'll be like moving things around and they'll drop them and they they they'll lose focus. But the kids will have this perfect focus. So something will happen where you know the the generation gap you know will show up. The other thing is that people are used to a sort of instant instantaneity that you click something and something happens. Especially in Japan, like there are a whole bunch of kids and they don't know what they're going to do when they grow up. But it's it's not like oh I'm I don't know what I want to do. Here are some options. It's I looked on Wikipedia for a while on biochemistry, and I'm really interested in biochemistry. And they sat there for four hours and went down the black hole of Wikipedia, and they don't remember um, that, you know, to actually learn something, you have to physically be around lab equipment, and, and you're physiologically learning something, too. And the brain at night, when you go to sleep, is, is dumping that data and saying, well, this isn't useful, it's not connected to anything. You know, you're, you're inputting things into your brain out of order. They're not whole chunks, you know, every tab in your browser is a different, like, not only a different space and time, but like a different type of content. And when you put that all into your brain at once, it's, it's making you know, your brain operating system really cluttered. But you can't really defragment your brain unless you, you know, go and disconnect. And when you do that, then you have no stimulus anymore. And, and so there's this kind of panic architecture that's happening where there's always these, these exciting points. You know, it's like 10 new messages, and each one, you don't know what it is, so it becomes like a present. And when you want to wrap a present, the excitement is that you have no idea what's inside. So, oh, I have to click that email. Oh, and then there's this over here. And then you're checking all these things to see if you have new messages because your, your physiological sense is connected to getting a new message, getting a like, getting a retweet, getting a plus one friend. And it becomes this video game that everybody's sucked into where they have to get enough of those per day or they don't feel like a good person or they feel worthless and they aren't self-actualized on Maslow's hierarchy because they, you know... <laughs> So it's it's a the other thing that's interesting too. I read an article recently about that, and um, even when you have your email on set for like you know check in every so often, like people even still find themselves resending to make, see if even if they just checked it like a few seconds before. Yeah, it's this compulsory thing. It's yeah. there's it's a therapist that are actually getting new new patients because of the addictions yeah, people are I having. Yeah, I think it's a dopamine addiction. Like yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, I agree. Exactly. There's also exactly. a thing called email apnea, where the <laughs> where the system <laughs> this is. This is so true, though. <laughs> yeah. I, w I went to this lecture on on this woman was talking about how you don't breathe like unless you've done um, music or you know some sort of singing in your life where you've learned how to breathe correctly. Sometimes you like stop breathing altogether or or breathe very shallowly when you're eating your email. Uh, and going on the computer because uh, it's hitting points in your brain that make you feel like you're in a jungle and you have to be hyper aware of everything. And that's why they also have this this campaign in Korea. It's the junk sleep campaign where you're not supposed to, you know, don't use computers two hours before bedtime because you'll get excited and you'll stay up all night and then you'll get junk sleep because your brain doesn't have enough time to defragment and reset correctly. You have a clean load of your brain's operating system when you wake up. <laughs> Korea is way ahead of us in Korea, sort of cyber They have those enormous tournaments where it's... I, I think it's in, in Korea where if you 
um, if you play a massive multiplayer online game and you're really good at it, you're the equivalent of a, an NBA star. Yeah, StarCraft. Yeah, StarCraft, thank you. Like, 5,000 person StarCraft tournaments. And, and, and it's actually a viable thing. Like, kids will be like, I really want to be a StarCraft champion when I grow up. And, and there's actually, like, lag that shows up if you play it around the world, you know. Even though everything's impulsing at the speed of light, it's still, there's some lag. And people can notice it, you know. Like, little bits of lag. So, so mobile gaming is huge there, and it's incredibly engaging, but also now there are sort of these camps for people to get off their addiction to yeah. being connected. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's a, a lot of camps in China, they have shock therapy camps where they shock kids to try and get them not to be addicted to computers, which is awful. Um, in some other places, they just take them out and they say, hey, learn how to climb a tree, get hurt, and get your first cut, because you've never been cut before. <laughs> like, I spent most of my time in the backyard as a kid, and I was always like just dirty, and it was awesome and wonderful, and falling out of trees and getting hurt all the time. You know, there's that thing that you can't get. You can travel all over the world through a computer, but you can't do that. Um, you know, you can't, a lot of people don't have yards anymore. They don't have any space. And if somebody falls on a playground, somebody gets hit with a lawsuit, you know? So nobody wants to get hurt anymore. But it's a very important part of being human. And when you're detached from that, you start to manifest it in another way, you know? Uh, attacking online, or you go and you become a character online. Mm -hmm. You know, you extend yourself in a certain way and you live through that and, you know, your physiology and your extension of self maps to that and you actually feel when somebody attacks you online, you know, even though nothing's really happening. You're totally perfectly safe, but your mentality is getting attacked. And so it's funny to watch these mappings, you know, kind of go on and how large is somebody's extended self, you know, if you mapped out how many mentions you had online and, and how people interacted with you. I always think of it like the great wizard of Oz. You know, Dorothy walks in there and Oz is this great and terrible guy, but he's really just a guy behind the screen like poking at buttons. That's how like any of us are with like an online persona. It's like, it's the great wizard. No, it's just somebody with buttons, you know, in a room at night. <laughs> it's not a big deal. You know, so it's, it's funny to look at that. Japan has some really interesting takes on that. There's this anime called Serial Experiments Lane where there's this girl and she's about age 14, and she's very, very shy in real life. But online, she's the superpower, you know, and it's the first uh, semblance where you see, like, the online self being really intense and kind of coming back into the real world and, and affecting things. And people definitely have the ability to do that, you know, you know network with people in, in different countries on Flickr, just through sharing, you know, what's in your brain. <laughs> and people are meeting people's brains before they're meeting their bodies, and so the bodies are starting to not... Uh, matter as much at all. Um, just kind of like a, you know, a great author, you're reading their mind through a book, through text. And I mean, text is the first greatest hallucinogen, like a hallucinogen, because you're reading and you come up with these characters that you like better than your next door neighbor, you know, and they kind of populate your mind. And the same with, with computing, that you have all these characters, but they're real instead, which is very curious. Um, I think a lot of people are scared because they don't know how to represent themselves online. You know, it must be really awkward for teenagers. They have their, their primary self and they have a secondary self and then that one's just really hard to handle and there's security and privacy, you know, and people are writing on their wall, which is basically like your front lawn. It's like somebody comes up and puts a bunch of flamingos on your front lawn and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> people post on your wall. So. Last call for questions. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thanks so much, Amber, for coming. And um, yeah. um, our next meeting will be industrial designer Joey Roth. Joey Roth designs products to articulate the beauty of everyday rituals. He combines simple functionality with honest, unfinished materials that become more personal as they take on a patina of use. His, he's especially interested in designing tools for ephemeral experiences like <coughs> tea and music. Roth's first two pr products were um, Sauropot, a minimalist teapot, and ceramic speakers. He'll share his newest designs, some sketches, and some projects on the brink of production during his presentation on December 14th. Thank you.